Rev, today marks the 60th anniversary, as you know well, of the March on Washington and Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. Many as a quarter of a million people gathered on the National Mall on this day in 1963. In honor of that moment, thousands gathered on the National Mall on Saturday, including Dr. King's family and a number of civil rights leaders, including yourself, Rev. You were there. This is something you've been telling us about for many months, anticipating it, connecting Dr. King's dream in that speech 60 years ago to where we are today. Tell us about the weekend, Rev. Well, the weekend was uh, very invigorating. We were able to uh, see a cross section of people uh, of all races, and it was intergenerational. Uh, we had projected and put on the uh, Parks Department permit that we expected 75,000 people. We did a lot more than that. When you looked out at the audience, it was under bushes because of the heat. But when we got ready to march, you could see throngs of people, interracial, intergenerational, uh, led by Martin Luther King III and Andrea Waters King, uh, who had the Drum Major Institute and me, National Action Network. But then it was the Anti-Defamation League, and it was the UNIDOS organization, one of the prime national organizations for Latinos and Asian Americans and Native Americans and young students. There were like uh, over 100 buses that came in from HBCUs that businessmen had helped National Action Network sponsor. And then in the middle of it all, not uh, knowing to us at the time, is this hate crime in Jacksonville. And before Martin and uh, Andre and I got back to the hotel, we heard about his shooting. So in many ways, uh, the unity and the hope that the march showed uh, and, and the believing in the dream uh, was hit with the reality that hate still exists with uh, the weapons uh, that are available to maximize that hate in terms of uh, AR-15 rifles, SWAT sticker uh, drawn on the rifle. The reality of where we are uh, hit us as we go forward uh, as uh, celebrating where we've come in 60 years, but realizing how far we still have to go. Yeah, and Rev, we'll talk more about that, that shooting in just a moment. But one of the things you were trying to do at this march was hold institutions accountable who made pledges after George Floyd was murdered but haven't actually delivered on them yet. Where are we with that? Talk a little bit about how the country has moved since George Floyd when it was a, you know, the images were everywhere, it was trending everywhere, companies were putting out press statements everywhere. What are they actually doing in the, in the name of racial justice and how much are they putting their money where their mouth is? Well, sadly, uh, we have a lot more broken promises than fulfillment. And one of the things that was stated at the march, and it was uh, central in my statement, was that we are going to target companies that have made commitments in the moment of George Floyd, in the moment of that movement, and George Floyd's brother Felonis and other were, others were there at the march, that have not lived up to it. There was over $300 billion committed. There were commitments made on contracts and commitments made on doing business that has not been fulfilled and in some cases totally uh, taken back. Uh, so when we looked at businessmen that were there that did uh, perform over and above their commitment, Robert Smith, a, a black billionaire, Robert Kraft, an NFL owner, marching with us, and we look at the list. We have done an analysis of the companies that made commitments and what they delivered. They will be the people uh, that we come out of this march uh, saying, you're going to keep your commitment or people need to know it and not uh, uh, be consumers of your product. The, the theme of my speech was that we're the dreamers, but we have to confront the schemers. It's dreamers and schemers coming out of this march. And as you said over the weekend, this is a continuation, not a commemoration of the March on Washington. A lot of work ahead. There is some legal news today. A judge is expected to set a trial date in the federal election interference case against former President Donald Trump. At 10 o'clock Eastern time this morning, lawyers for both Trump and the Justice Department are scheduled to appear before District Court Judge Tanya Chutkin for a status hearing. The team for special counsel Jack Smith has proposed the trial begin in early January of this coming year. In response, Trump's lawyers requested the trial not begin until April of 2026. 
The former president has pleaded not guilty to four charges related to his alleged efforts to stay in power following his 2020 election loss to Joe Biden. Meanwhile, regarding the charges against Trump and 18 co-defendants in Georgia for election interference, former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows is pushing to move his case from Fulton County to a federal court. There are at least four witnesses subpoenaed to testify at today's hearing on that matter, including Georgia's Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger. Meadows was on the now infamous call where Donald Trump asked to find the necessary votes to win the state. I only need 11,000 votes. Fellas, I need 11,000 votes. Give me a break. So, look, all I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have, because we won the state. There's nothing wrong with saying that, you know, uh, that you've recalculated. January 2nd, 2021, Meadows plans to argue he was acting in his capacity as the top aide to former President Trump. So it should be in federal court. Also today, the court will be considering a push by several of the defendants for a speedy trial. Let's bring in NBC News Justice and Intelligence Correspondent Ken Delaney. And Ken, good morning. Let's go back to the federal matter first in Washington with Judge Chutkin announcing, we think, at about 10 o'clock this morning after that hearing, a trial date for the Jack Smith special counsel prosecution of Donald Trump for an attempt to overturn the 2020 election. What are you hearing about that gulf between the proposed dates, one early January 2024, the other from the Trump team, April of 2026? Where might it fall in there? Good morning, Willie. Well, both proposals are probably unrealistic, but the Trump's team proposal is sort of in left field, is not even what remotely realistic. So most legal observers believe that Judge Tanya Chutkin is going to set a trial date sometime next year before the November 2024 election. It's not likely to be in January of next year. It could be uh, around this time or in the summer at some point. And whatever date she set may not she sets may not hold, but it'll give us an idea of her thinking about how quickly this case can get to trial. I'll be covering this hearing outside of that federal, federal courthouse today. It's actually, as, as pretrial um, positioning goes, this is probably one of the most important pretrial hearings in this case because of the profound effects on the election. Um, and, and it's really our first chance to hear from Judge Chutkin on, on a really important matter. So, so, Ken, can you just spell out then what this could mean in terms of the timing and its and the run up to the election um, and, and what we might learn by the end of today? Well, Katie, we're going to learn, you know, exactly how Judge Chuck can views this case in terms of its complexity and whether she buys at all the defense arguments that, you know, because they're receiving eleven and a half million documents. Remember that uh, they, they they said it equivalent to reading War and Peace eight times a day from now until the beginning of the trial, whether whether that means that they need a year or more to prepare for this trial. The prosecution, the special counsel has said that's ridiculous. Yes, it's a lot of documents. Documents, but, you know, we're in a computer age. You can use keyword searches. We're going to help you uh, tell you what the key documents are. Besides which, a lot of this evidence is very familiar. It was developed and made public by the January 6th committee. So we're going to see what Judge Chutkin thinks of these arguments and, and it, whether she sets a trial date before, uh, before the summer, before the November election. It's really going to set the tone for where this thing goes from here. So going down to Fulton County, Georgia, Ken, Mark Meadows has said, I want this in federal court. I don't want to be tried by Fonnie Lewis. I don't want to be prosecuted by Fonnie Willis. So what is your sense of his chances of that? Most people say that that's probably a long shot. Do you think there's a shot he gets it moved out of there? I think there's a better chance than, say, Donald Trump had when he tried to do the same thing in the New York case. But just to be clear, I've been told actually that the Georgia prosecutors, the DA, could, could continue to prosecute this case in federal court. They may have mm. to bring in uh, prosecutors who have federal experience. They may have to file some paperwork to appear in federal court. But nothing would change about this case if he wins, except that it would be heard by a federal judge. It would still be the state charges. It's a, it's a weird 1789 law designed to protect federal officials who are acting under the color of their authority in office. Of course, the biggest argument against 
uh, Meadows in this situation. As you heard the tape there, the, the recording, Donald Trump was not acting as president in that moment. He was talking about the election. He was asking right. the Secretary of State of Georgia to find votes. So if Meadows was sitting in that meeting or involved in that meeting or other activities like that, uh, and, and he claims he was acting as a federal official, the DA is going to say, well, sir, then weren't you violating the Hatch Act, which prohibits federal government officials from engaging in politics? So it'll be interesting to see exactly what his argument is there, Willie. A new National Emerson College survey released just within the last hour shows Donald Trump's support dropped six points from a poll taken earlier this month. The former president still overwhelmingly leads his opponents, though. Fifty percent of Republicans saying they do plan to vote for Donald Trump in next year's primary. Ron DeSantis, Vivek Ramaswamy back there, two and three, but 38, 40 points behind. Let's bring in while Republican presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy, who you see there in third place, appeared on two Sunday shows yesterday. Some of his exchanges with Chuck Todd on Meet the Press. If you believe Donald Trump is the greatest president of the 21st century, he's running. Why are you running against him? Why do you think his second term won't be as good as his first? Well, look, I did say he's the best president of the 21st century. From George Bush to Barack Obama to Joe Biden to Donald Trump, I think it's not even close. Who was the best of those presidents? In my book, I judge by results. That being said, I believe I can take the America First agenda even further than Donald Trump did. All right, again, from your book, no one likes a sore loser. That's one of the worst victim complexes of all. Are you referring to Donald Trump? I referred in that chapter both to Stacey Abrams and to Donald Trump. And I think that the answer is we need leaders who ultimately stand for victory over victimhood. Let me bring up a couple of questions you didn't get a chance to answer at the debate. Most of the candidates on stage Wednesday night said Mike sure. Pence did the right thing on January 6th. Do you agree? I would have done it very differently. I think that there was a historic opportunity that he missed to reunite this country in that window. Here's what I would have said. We need single day voting on Election Day. We need paper ballots and we need government issued ID matching the voter file. And if we achieve that, then we have achieved victory and we should not have any further complaint about election integrity. So what would, so what I would, would have you driven have done through the Senate? So what would you have done as, with Mike Pence? You would have so not capacity, certified the election? So in, in my capacity as president of the Senate, I would have led through that level of reform, then on that condition certified the election results, served it up to the president, yeah. President Trump then to sign that into law, and on January 7th declared the re-election campaign pursuant to a free and fair election. I think that was a missed opportunity. Vivek Ramaswamy on Meet the Press. Joining us now, senior columnist at the Daily Beast, Matt Lewis. Matt, good morning. Uh, before we dig into your latest piece titled Trump and Ramaswamy Show Us uh, How the Worst Get to the Top, parse through some of what he was saying last, yesterday with Chuck. I mean, we heard a lot of that at the debate the other night. Does he believe any of that? I mean, he's a smart guy, either without question. It sounds very cynical to most people listening that he's trying to sort of impersonate Trump, be a stand-in for Donald Trump. I like the Ramaswamy who wrote the book like two years ago, who made some very yeah. good points. Not as much the Ramaswamy today, who is contradicting and flip-flopping on all those points. And uh, look, he is a very, obviously a very intelligent person. He's very eloquent. Uh, he can go on TV and express himself uh, very well. And then it's only after you, you unpack the points he makes that you realize um, most of them are kind of BS. Um, so, for example, the idea that Mike Pence, the vice president of the United States, had the, uh, the power to tell states who, by the way, run elections, you know, that, that Mike Pence had the constitutional power to tell these states they had to do in-person voting and that they had to have paper ballots and all of these things. And that it was Mike Pence's responsibility, not Donald Trump's response. Remember, Donald Trump is telling people, don't do mail-in voting, which Again, interestingly, Vivek actually did mail-in voting. Later on, Chuck Todd asked him how he voted in 2020. He didn't vote in person. He did mail-in voting, and he cited a global pandemic as the reason why he did mail-in voting. Well, maybe that's why a lot of other people did the same thing. So, uh, again, if you just listen to him, maybe you're flipping the channel or, or something. He sounds incredibly compelling and eloquent. Uh, but when you start to unpack the things he's saying, they usually don't really hold water. 
And that's what happened on the debate stage as well. When he said, cut off all the funding for Ukraine, I'd issue a preemptive pardon for Donald Trump and climate change is a hoax. In the case of yesterday's interview with Chuck, Chuck just read his book back to him and said, well, that's not what you were saying two years ago in your book. In your piece, Matt, you write this, quote, how is it that tech bro Vivek Ramaswamy, a self-described skinny kid with a funny name who's never held public office, rarely even votes, and has been on both sides of numerous issues, became the hottest commodity in the Republican Party. How was he considered one of the big winners of Wednesday night's debate, despite his unctuous and demagogic performance? If you want my honest answer, why should we expect anything less? The concomitant buzz surrounding Ramaswamy reminds us the problem isn't Trump per se, but a culture that rewards and incentivizes Trumpian behavior. Once you understand and accept this reality, it's easier to make political predictions regarding the GOP. Who wins? The people who have no sense of shame, the people who are willing to kiss your butt or slit your throat, depending on the circumstances. The real danger, Matt writes, is not Ramaswamy or Trump, but what our enthrallment with politicians like them says about one of our two major political parties. And so where does that leave then, Matt Lewis, someone like Nikki Haley, who a lot of people think had a good night the other night, or Mike Pence or Chris Christie, who's been the most openly critical of Donald Trump, who are trying to in many ways, go about this like a conventional presidential campaign and watching Donald Trump and Vivek Ramaswamy rise next to them. Well, look, on one hand, Willie, I think if you watch that debate, you could say, um, hey, there's hope, right? If you are a Reagan Republican, if you're a freedom conservative, if you're someone who believes in kind of limited government and traditional conservative values, not the quote unquote new right, you might have watched that debate and concluded, hey, everything's great. Uh, you know, Chris Christie did a great job of supporting Ukraine against Russia's invasion. Mike Pence uh, rhetorically did a great job. And I think Nikki Haley did a fantastic job. She, I believe, overperformed certainly my expectation. So you might have watched that debate and concluded things are pretty good. And, 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 uh, and if Trump were to disappear, we might be in OK shape. The Republican Party might come back. The problem is if you start to actually add up the polling and consider who's winning, uh, something like 75 or 80 percent of Republican voters are supporting either Donald Trump, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy or Ron DeSantis. So it's, you know, the, the, the people that we've mentioned here, the Mike Pence, Nikki Haley, uh, Chris Christie, that's like maybe 20, 21 percent of the vote. Um, and so maybe it's not as cheery as the debate made it look. And the last thing I would add, uh, Willie, is is the attention economy uh, right now. Who is getting the attention and the buzz and the excitement? It's Vivek Ramaswamy. He is winning that argument, uh, or at least that that part of the campaign right now. And, uh, you know, in my piece, I talk about uh, this high, famous Hayek book, of course, The Road to Serfdom. And he, mm -hmm. he talks in it. He has a chapter that talks about why the worst get on top. He was talking about totalitarian regimes where, like the old Soviet Union, uh, it, it, it's not uh, Trotsky who ends up, you know, succeeding Lenin. Right. It's, it's the worst. It's Stalin. It's someone who's willing to do whatever it takes to win. Obviously, we are blessed that we do not live in that kind of regime here in America. But I think that the dynamic is is similar, that it is the worst people in the Republican Party right now who are more likely to do what it takes to get to the top. Today marks the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington and Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. As many as a quarter of a million people gathered on the National Mall on this day in 1963. In honor of that moment, thousands gathered on the National Mall on Saturday, including Dr. King's family and a number of civil rights leaders. We need us all to be engaged. Dad would probably say, now is the time. We must preserve, protect, and expand democracy. The dreamers will win. The dreamers will march. The dreamers will stand up. Black, white, Jewish, LGBTQ. We are the dreamers. We're the children of the dream. Let us march in the name of the dreamers. As we remember and honor the lives and legacies of those who forged the path that we walk towards acceptance and equal rights, we, be, we would be remiss if we did not also honor and acknowledge the black LGBTQ history and undergirding of the march. If you're a young woman like me, 
you could have fewer personal rights. And no matter who you are, you could be less safe from random gun violence and irreversible climate change. That's why I believe that my generation will be defined by action, not apathy. That's Yolanda King, the 15-year-old granddaughter of Dr. King. Joining us now, the CEO of the Anti-Defamation League, Jonathan Greenblatt. The ADL was one of the organizations that participated in Saturday's march. Also with us, Pulitzer Prize-winning author, presidential historian Doris Kearns Goodwin. Good morning to you both, Jonathan. We saw you there marching right next to Reverend Sharpton uh, over the weekend. Tell us why it was so important, you believe, to have your organization, the ADL, as part of this commemoration. Well, Willie, I'm so glad you asked, and this is a powerful way to start the week, because the truth is, is that 60 years ago, my predecessor, the man who had this job, Ben Epstein, <clears throat> was there at the Lincoln Memorial standing with Dr. King, and ADL had marched with Dr. King years before, and then years later in Selma, ADL was there. So it was important for me to be there to honor that legacy. But I got to say, Willie, what really stands with me and sits with me this morning is, you know, the Rev said this is a continuation, not a commemoration. And while we marched, the shooting took place in Jacksonville, just as, you know, 60 years ago, after they marched, there was the bombing of the church in Birmingham. So the fight against hate, the, the, this battle isn't just a battle for black people. It's a battle for Jewish people. It's a battle for all of us because the hate that's coming for them is also coming for us. So for me, it was crucial to be there to honor the legacy and to also be clear about the fact that the fight continues and we're all in this together. Jonathan, uh, Al Shopton, one of the things that I think was so important about uh, Saturday uh, as we gathered is not only were the numbers even more than we had put on the Fox permit. Uh, but it was diverse. A lot of people from yeah. different races and backgrounds came. And uh, as you said, uh, we look at the fact that we're looking at Jacksonville that was happening while we marched and some of the concerns we had. You and I and the National Urban League, Mark Morial and Lulac and others, had convened a hate crime summit a year ago at the White House with President Biden and Vice President uh, Harris. Here we are a year later, and hate explodes in Jacksonville while we're marching. You and I are part of the organizers' meeting uh, with the King family and President Biden today. Is it not time to move toward real hard legislation that would disarm the haters? Uh, if we can't stop the hate, we can at least take the kinds of weapons. Let's not forget he, this guy in Jacksonville targeted blacks, but put a SWAT sticker on the ammunition, yeah. which is blacks and Jews. You and I may not agree on everything. I'm sure members of your board and my board don't agree on everything, but we're targeted and we're not doing anything about disarming those that would target us. Look, you're making a really important point. African-Americans Anti-black hate crimes are the largest number of hate crimes in the country, according to the FBI. Black people are the most targeted on a volume basis. And on a per capita basis, Jews are the most targeted minority. So our two communities, as I said at the Lincoln Memorial, our fates are intertwined. They are really indivisible. And we need action because, Rev, we should keep in mind that what happened in Jacksonville, to be honest, it wasn't a surprise. Yes, there's a through line from from uh, Charleston to Charlottesville to El Paso to Pittsburgh to Buffalo and now to Jacksonville. But it's also not a surprise because if you look at extremist related murders over the last decade, 75 percent of them have been committed by right wing extremists. And look, there's hate on both sides. No one political party has a monopoly on morality. But the problem of violent extremism and white supremacy, you know, Rev, they're coming for you and they're coming for me. And we have going to talk to the president today and demand the kind of action to finally deter and stop this kind of madness before it spreads even further. 
Doris, talk about um, something you've been thinking about, which is the importance of, of a kind of sense of community and collective <clears throat> consciousness. You know, I think most people from the outside would look at America in the late 60s and think that was a time of enormous tumult and lack of com sense of community. But actually, if you look at trying to get common action today, the country is so divided and so polarized, it's hard to see how America comes together on almost, any, on almost anything, but particularly on the big issues that we've been talking about this morning. Yeah, I mean, I think what's shattered more than anything between the march and today is that sense of a common consciousness that can be fired up. And once it's fired up, change happens. People say, this isn't the world we want to live in. We want something different. That's what I felt. I mean, I was there 60 years ago, 20 years old. I was in between my junior and senior years in college. It was the most cherished moment of my memory. And it's not just nostalgia because I was 20 years old. It was really the first time I ever felt that I was involved with something far bigger than myself. The first time I ever felt that I was involved with something that could make a difference in the country. You know, but what's important to remember, we in history recognize that we know that march ended up well. 250,000 people, not a moment of violence. At the time, people were so anxious in those weeks before. I remember in Washington, a state of emergency had been set up that day. All hospitals were not to do elective surgery. They expected so many casualties. The baseball game was canceled. Bars were closed. Liquor stores were closed. The buses that came in had to leave that night. There was such a fear of violence. What an incredible job A. Philip Randolph and all those people did to organize it so well. Even JFK was worried about the march. He had introduced a civil rights bill earlier that summer, and he was afraid it was ill-timed. And I remember this meeting, not remember this meeting, I heard about this meeting, where Martin Luther King said, you always say that things that I'm involved in are ill-timed. And I think actually this timing is really good, because it'll show the country what we're fighting in the South. And I remember when I got there, I was given a, a, a round pin that said, um, March for Jobs and Freedom. And then I had a, a poster, which is perfectly suited for what we're talking to today about the ADL and the black community. Mine was Catholics, Jews, and Protestants unite for civil rights. And all those people there, just looking at them, there was a sense of community. Of course, I remember Martin Luther King's speech. But even more, I think I remember at the very ending of the march, we all held hands and we sung, we shall overcome together. There was that sense, it wasn't black, it wasn't white, it was all of us together as part of America. And you're so right, that's what's been shattered today. And how do we get that back? I mean, look what happened after Birmingham, when Bull Connor sent those dogs against the Children's Crusade in 1863. It fired the conscience of the country. It helped to lead to that Civil Rights Act. When the troopers in Selma came against the people marching peacefully on the bridge, that helped to fire the conscience and the, civil right, and the Voting Rights Act was passed. It's that conscience we need to get, that sense of community, once back again. If we have that, we can move forward. Without it, we can't. Doris, how lucky for us to have a first-person account of the March on Washington from you this morning. And if you can, just for our viewers, everyone, of course, knows that the I Have a Dream speech was a watershed moment in this country. But just put into context where we were as a country at that point in August of 1963. As Rev pointed to in our last hour, it was just about two and a half weeks later, the Birmingham bombing that killed four young girls, 14 and 11-year-old girls, at the church there at the 16th Street Baptist Church. And of course, less than a year later, the Civil Rights Act was signed. There was so much in the air in this moment when Dr. King stepped up to that microphone. Yeah, I mean, I think what was so important is that for, for many years already, um, black people in the South and with their white compatriots, too, had been sitting in, they'd been marching, they'd been demonstrating in one state after another. And what the march meant was that all of these people came together as a national thing. One of the important things that King said, not only I have a dream, but he talked about at the end, let freedom ring. And then he went through all the parts of America, let freedom ring. He was really stitching together the whole country that was now recognizing that civil rights was a problem, not just for black people, but for all of us to be a better country as a result of that. It was a very tumultuous decade, just as you say. Um, but there was a sense that hate could be met by 
conscience. And that's the critical thing that happened. It was met time and again. And unless we do that again, the hate's out there. It was out there. You saw that. You're right. In the, in the poor, four poor kids at the Baptist church right after it, just as we saw in Jacksonville, right in the middle of this march. But I think, as the Rev has said, and, and all of us have been saying this morning, there's only one measure of hate that we can bring to it, and that's to fight, to keep demonstrating, to march, and to make sure that we take away the, the, the reasons that these people are able to exercise their, help, their hate upon us. That march. It was an a... extraordinary decade. I'm glad I grew up then. It was, a, it was a time, it was a turbulent time, but it was a sense in which you felt that private lives were connected to public policy. And it's that feeling again. I hope the younger generation can know what it was like. I'm glad to have been young in the 1960s. The threat of another shutdown looming. Lawmakers are set to return to Capitol Hill next month and face a packed schedule. The federal government will run out of money on September 30th. Between now and then, there are 11 days, 11 days where both the House and Senate are in session. Meanwhile, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is pushing forward on his threat of a possible impeachment inquiry into President Biden. So if you look at all the information we've been able to gather so far, it is a natural step forward that you would have to go to an impeachment inquiry. McCarthy's comments come as he claims the president has not provided documents concerning Republicans' multiple investigations. House Republicans have alleged the Biden family has received payments from foreign countries as well as preferential treatment for Hunter Biden. In a social media post last night, former President Trump criticized Republican lawmakers for not moving forward with that threat of an inquiry, writing in part, impeach the bum or fade into oblivion. Let's bring in Democratic member of the House Oversight Committee, Congressman Ro Khanna of California. Congressman, it's good to have you with us. So the chairman of your committee, James Comer, has said previously that, in fact, they are getting all the documents that they've asked for from all the organizations they've asked for them from. He's also said, well, we haven't drawn a connection yet between Hunter Biden and President Biden, but we believe there's a lot of smoke. So far, no fire. What is your sense of why they're going through this exercise and where it ends? Well, talk about a downshift from your previous segment where we're talking about the inspiring March on Washington and Dr. King and now the petty politics of the modern house. I mean, what we should be doing in the House is talking about legislation for the racist shooting in Jacksonville. What we should be doing in the House is talking about economic costs, child care costs. Instead, this speaker is not focused on the issues that people care about. I didn't get one question in my town hall uh, well, last night on Hunter Biden or Joe Biden. And that's because the American people know the facts. Joe Biden, there's not a single shred of evidence that a single payment went to President Biden. And Donald Trump's post reveals everything. It's total politics. It's because he was impeached twice, and he's running in 2024. They want to try to bloody up the president for 2024. This is all politics, and has nothing to do either with the law or helping the American public. So, Congressman, while the Republicans are focusing on this potentially in impeachment inquiry, one thing the American people probably do care about is the federal government staying open. And as we just noted, there's not a lot of time to get a deal done. There have been some momentum to perhaps some sort of short-term spending uh, bill passed. Um, but what's your sense of where things stand? A lot of stuff can change over recess, as you well know. Uh, where do you see this going when you guys resume next month? How worried are you the government could shut down? I'm concerned. And the reality is that the president made a deal with the speaker to avoid the debt uh, default. Uh, some of us didn't like the deal. I didn't like the deal. I mean, it, uh, in my view, had two harsh uh, cuts on social programs that the president made a deal. And now the speaker is saying, no, that deal uh, is no longer valid. We want additional cuts to uh, programs like Social Security or Medicare uh, or other uh, housing programs. And that's just not going to fly. He's got to stick to the deal that he made with the president. Uh, again, the problem, though, is he's got a caucus that on his side that was upset with that deal. And the question is whether he's going to be able to persuade them. But it is a uh, risky situation. And like you said, they're only about 11, 12 days to get this done. Uh, Congressman, let's take a, a little detour from electoral politics and talk about something that I think every single parent around America is concerned about at the moment, and that's childcare and the cost of childcare. There really is a, a crisis. It's costing something like 10,000 
dollars a year on average for people just to look after their children. It's far too much money. You and Congresswoman um, Nancy Mace of South Carolina, the Republican, have are launching a, a child care caucus. What, what do you think you can do to make child care more affordable for Americans? Well, according to a Republican pollster, 86 percent of Americans believe that the government needs to do something to bring down child care costs. As you pointed out, it's on average $10,000 for every family, almost 10 percent of the income. And 85 percent of women say that when they leave a job, it is often because of child care concern. So we need to do a few things. One, we need to provide more government support for child care. On September 30th, there's a cliff. The American Rescue Plan funding runs out. Almost 70,000 child care centers will lose money. Uh, I'm working with Fancy Base and others to try to get that funding extended in the short term. In the long run, I believe we should have $10 a day child care. That would be the maximum cost of $2,400 uh, a year for families. And that is something that the government should be willing to support through quality uh, child care providers. Child care cliff, something a lot of people may not know about, but ought to look into. Democratic Congressman Ro Khanna of California, thanks so much for being here this morning. We appreciate it. So Republican presidential candidates are hitting the campaign trail in South Carolina. Former Governor Nikki Haley and Senator Tim Scott will hold separate events in their home state today. Scott has four planned stops while Haley will host a town hall. Now, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis was also supposed to visit South Carolina today, but canceled the trip due to the deadly and racially motivated shooting in Jacksonville, as well as the tropical storm that's expected to make landfall in his home state of Florida later this week. Joining us now from South Carolina is NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale. Also with us, co-founder and CEO of All In Together, Lauren Leader. Ali, let's start with you in the Palmetto State there. Give us a sense as to what we'll hear from these two candidates. There's a sense among most Republicans that Nikki Haley did quite well for herself in that debate last week, while Tim yeah. Scott made less of an impression. What are you looking for today? Yeah, Jonathan, I think that's the right view coming out of last week's debate. And it's why both of these South Carolina natives are coming back to their home state with really opposite goals. For Haley, it's to try to continue riding that wave of momentum that she built last Wednesday on the debate stage in Milwaukee. And for Senator Tim Scott, it's to try to walk the walk of what his advisors were saying behind the scenes, which is that Wednesday night's debate was a no big deal effectively for them. It wasn't a make or break moment in the words of one senior advisor. And for Scott, he's just trying to continue out here on the campaign trail, getting as many events in as he can. Frankly, before he gets hunkered down in D.C. for September, what's likely to be an aggressive funding battle in the House and the Senate, and where, as we're likely barreling towards a government shutdown. So that's going to make it a little bit harder for Senator Scott to stay out on the campaign trail at a consistent clip. It's why we're watching him try to bank so many events now and potentially next week in these critical states. But for someone like former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley, what Wednesday night's Milwaukee debate showed was that she could be the adult in the room, leveraging the fact that she has deep executive experience as a two-term governor of this state, but also foreign policy experience as a former U.N. ambassador. Those, of course, were key moments for her. But I think the other thing that we're watching her do coming out of the debate is try to be the, the adult voice in the room on abortion access. This is an issue that we've talked about a lot. I know we were talking about this on the show last week. We will continue talking about it because reproductive rights has been such a galvanizing issue at the ballot box for abortion advocates, it's really cut against Republicans. And it's the thing that I hear from Republican sources consistently, that these Republican candidates will get pushed to the right and boxed in on restrictive abortion policy. And then they're going to have to figure out a way to campaign on that in a general where they are squarely out of step with the American public. For someone like Nikki Haley, She's sort of trying to have it both ways by saying that there's, on a process perspective, no way for them to do any kind of abortion ban on a national federal level because they don't have the numbers in the House and Senate and haven't had them in decades. She's right, but she's also using that as an opportunity to get out of the conversation that many of us are asking these candidates about, which is where is the right weak mark for them? For people like Pence, he says at least 15. For people like DeSantis, I think it's fair to assume that he's at six weeks because that's what he signed in Florida, though he's dodged on that 
that question. For Haley, she's really trying to play it both ways by saying to the base that she's pro-life, which of course she is, but then by trying to speak to a general election audience by saying that whatever Republicans are saying about a national abortion ban can't actually get done because they lack the numbers. Nevertheless, I think a lot of us are still going to keep trying to press her on where the right weak mark is. But I do think it's a fascinating dynamic for the only woman on the stage to be taking on this role where Republican women, and Lauren knows this, typically eschew gender and identity politics altogether. Yeah, and certainly that's what we heard from her on the stage last week. But one of her go-to tactics on the campaign, yeah. campaign trail has been not to go after President Biden, but instead to attack his yes. vice president, Kamala Harris. Let's take a listen. And my concern is we cannot have Kamala Harris as president. We can't chance this. Kamala continues to mess up everywhere that she can. The one job that she's been given has been the border. She refuses to go there. So she gives us these word salads on things that just don't make sense. And she continues to sound extreme. On Biden and Harris's watch, this woke self-loathing has swept our country. It's in the classroom, the boardroom, and the back rooms of government. We're told our country is flawed, rotten, and full of hate. Joe and Kamala even say that America's racist. I've actually been to the border, and I didn't pull a Kamala, go and come back. I went 400 miles down that border. So, Lauren, a lot of Republicans are sort of subtly making this argument. It's invoking President Biden's age, suggesting that really this next election is about his vice president, Kamala Harris. You'd be putting her in charge. But Haley has been doing this by far the most explicitly. What is your read of this strategy? Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. She's certainly trying to play on the low approval ratings, which we've talked about on the show before, that Kamala continues to uh, deal with, which is that she has had these sort of historically low uh, approval ratings relative to other vice presidents. And I think Haley is banking on the fact that Kamala, just her name is so galvanizing for folks on the right. They loathe her and that that is going to be a winning strategy. I do think there's a lot of irony there. And then some of what Ali was getting to before is that on the one hand, Nikki Haley is willing to invoke her gender. She did it. It was one of her first sort of comments on the debate stage, right? Invoking Margaret Thatcher, that if you want something uh, done right, ask a woman. And then on the other hand, sort of playing on this idea that Kamala is somehow secretly the shadow president, which is also sort of disinformation and has some gendered tropes there, too. And so in a way, she's trying to get it both ways. And I think that's what Ali's been pointing out really consistently, also about her abortion stance. It's a really difficult path, in a sense, for Nikki Haley. She's operating and running in a party that is overwhelmingly male, that has a history of, you know, lots of sexist attacks, et cetera but also trying to appeal to the Republican women who will be vital uh, in the election and are certainly vital primary voters, while also playing down her gender and playing up her gender and also lobbying gendered attacks against the first woman vice president. It, it's not a, a simple knot to untangle. I, I also think that it is a very cynical play uh, to try and play on the fact that she's trying to imply that President Biden will not be, uh, be there for his whole four uh, years if he's reelected, uh, which I think is very cynical to suggest. As also, she's also playing to certain elements of the Republican Party on race. That you uh, you you talking about President Harris, uh, which who is she? A black woman and a and a woman. And I think for uh, Nikki Haley herself. Uh, having uh, being a, a, a woman of color, I think it's very cynical on all ends uh, that she's making some implicit appeals to some biases that I feel she has to be intelligent enough to know what she's playing into. Lauren, this is I think this has always been a really complicated line for Republicans of color. And I think you see Tim Scott on these issues, too, where, you know, he is has obviously, you know, talks about his childhood and his race, but yet, you know, completely doubles down in the other direction, which is that he has never been a victim of racism, that he doesn't experience those things, that the country is not racist, et cetera. And I think you see Nikki Haley trying to do some of the same thing. On the one hand, playing her gender, uh, focusing on trying to connect with uh, with Republican women, you know, who do need a home in a sense. And I think that's not the wrong calculus. We've had mostly Republican male candidates just completely overlook women's issues. Um, as we talked about, the abortion stuff, I think, is leaving them at odds with a growing number of Republican women. And uh, it's a really tight line and a complicated 
act. And I think people are calling it out because it's really difficult. And this White House and the president's reelection campaign, they know that this time around the vice president will be far more central to this election than in 2020. Co-founder and CEO of All In Together, Lauren Leader, thank you so much. And NBC's Ali Vitale, there for us in South Carolina, thank you as well. Executive director of the March on Washington, the man who organized this whole thing, Mr. Bayard Rustin. The first demand is that we have effective civil rights legislation, no compromise, no filibuster, and that it includes public accommodation, decent housing, integrated education, FEPC, and the right to vote. What do you say? That was the architect of the March on Washington, civil rights activist Bayard Rustin. One of the greatest organizers in American history, Rustin was the main planner for that famed 1963 march. Yet, as an openly gay man in the 1960s, he stayed behind the scenes and largely out of the spotlight. Now his story is being told in the upcoming biopic, Rustin the first feature film from Higher Ground Productions. That, of course, is Barack and Michelle Obama's production company. And let's take a look at the film's trailer, which was just released this morning. This new generation is restless and angry. The pacifist is opposed to using violence, but must be prepared to receive it. You're irrelevant. It's Friday night. I've been called worse. <laughs> Your mere presence could derail the fight for racial justice in this country a good 10, 15 years. On the day that I was born black, I was also born a homosexual. Sometimes you gotta fight back to get We're to calling back. for a peaceful march on Washington. We are committed to the cause of altering the trajectory of this country towards freedom. They either believe in freedom and justice for all. Or they do not. And joining us now is the film's director, George C. Wolfe. He has won a Director's Guild Award and five Tonys. George, thank you so much for being here this morning. Glad to be here. Um, it is, of course, the anniversary today. We have spent a lot of time this morning talking about it. Um, there are... People think of that day, they think of Martin Luther King Jr., of course. They think of Adam Clayton Powell Jr., they think of John Lewis. But tell us about Bayard Rustin and why you feel like this is the moment we should all get to know him, too. Well, Bayard was, as, as you stated earlier, an astonishing organizer. It's remarkable to think that they planned initially for 100,000 people to show up, and they had eight weeks to do it. And instead, 250,000 people showed up. And, and, and there was everything there from phones there so the reporters could call in stories to water fountains and all these details that you don't think about. But it's one of the reasons why the march ran so smoothly. It's also one of the things that's interesting. Sound, he's, he, he had this theory that sound was so important. And sound how, is how you turn a crowd into an audience. And so he required a very sophisticated sound system so that everybody was a part of the same moment. So just just every single miraculous detail that you can think of, he covered and then some. Uh, George, I, I, this is Al Sharpton. I, I have been blessed to uh, have seen a screening of this film, and it is very well done. It's amazing. And uh, Thank you. when I was 16 years old in 1991, uh, uh, I was able, I mean, 1971, I'm sorry, uh, I, I started, I, I, I kind of was trying to rob 20 years, but I'm not going to do that. But in 1971, I started my own youth group. I uh, had uh, left the youth director of Operation Breadbasket New York chapter and formed National Youth Movement. And I went to see Byard Rustin who many of the older ministers were shunning uh, even at that late period in 71 wow. because of the homophobia and all. And uh, I 
asked him, how do you organize? He started telling me about doing this. He put me in touch with labor. And I'm a 16-year-old kid. And when I left, I was saying, uh, Mr. Rustin, thank you for your time. He says, young man, how are you going to start your own group with no money? And he gave me the first $500 check. Uh, he told Rochelle Harwards, give the young man the check. Fast forward three years ago, I told this at an A. Philip Randolph Institute conference that Bride Rustin founded the conference, uh, uh, named after A. Philip Randolph. And Rochelle Harwood stood up and said, he's telling the truth. I gave him the check. Wow. And she's also one of the features in your film. Absolutely. Talk about how Rochelle and Bayard worked with labor and really enacted a lot of the things that Dr. King and others in the civil rights movement leadership at that time that we remember today. They were like the ones that were the wheels that kept a coalition together of labor and civil rights and other groups. Absolutely. And, 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 and one of the things that's really interesting is that when certain civil rights organizations were a little bit cautious about joining in, they engaged labor. And so they were able to, to put into place all the dynamics that, that they wouldn't have otherwise. And they formed these incredibly intense coalitions. And Bayer did, did what he did primarily with a team of, like, like, like Rochelle, a, a, a team of, of, of kids. They were, they were in their late teens and early 20s, and they would work 12, 14 hours a day solving all these problems, making connections. He formed a coalition with, with the Guardians, which was a black fraternal organization of police, and trained them individually in nonviolence. And those were the primary p p policing forces that were at play in, uh, in, in Washington, D.C. So he engaged every single aspect he, he got he convinced mayor wagner to alter the subway schedule so that therefore it was a rush hour schedule at six o'clock in the morning so that everybody could meet their various buses around the city so he engaged labor he engaged the city he engaged the police he engaged anybody who he possibly could just to pull off this phenomenal e event and and there were all sorts of fears that violence and all sorts of things were, were going to happen that were going to be horrible and nothing like that occurred because it was so smooth, so efficient, and so gloriously focused on the agenda, which is altering, altering the, the, the direction that the country was going in terms of race. George, just changing the subject just a little bit, I mean, obviously, I know the directors are not on strike. It's so great to have you here. It's so great to have some new content being released. How much has the strike in Hollywood affected your own role out of the film? Well, it's, it's, it's interesting because I'm, because I'm sitting here talking as opposed to some young, handsome, or beautiful actor instead of, me. It's, it, 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 instead of me. So it, it, it's had an impact but, uh, in, in terms of that respect. But other than that, the film's all completely done. It, we, we, we released the trailer, so we're really excited about sharing it, sharing it with the world, and, but more so sharing the story of this phenomenal Phenomenal American more than anything else. He he changed. He he altered this country in such a substantive way. And because of who he was, and because he was unapologetically who he was, he was he was put, every he was pushed more and more and more into the background. But finally, his story is being told and shared in a in a really expansive way. And I hope everybody will watch it and see how important it is to honor those who have come before. Well, you are certainly a handsome enough face to promote it. We really appreciate you being here this morning. The new film, Rustin, will be in select theaters on November 3rd and on Netflix, November 17th. Director George C. Wolfe, thank you again for being here. Congratulations on the film.